a distant boundary, a legendary frontier that today is highly developed. The West Coast still possesses a strong power of attraction. Many myths still persist there. They attract dreamers by the thousand. So you have to get away from the coast to find nature in its purest form. A nature of majestic landscapes, shaped by the relentless erosion of wind, rain and rivers over millions of years. Man has left his mark on an environment that he has managed to tame for his own comfort and pleasure. He has succeeded in overcoming daunting geographical constraints and everywhere has drawn the best from the land. Man has been present here for thousands of years. At one with nature, many different cultures succeeded each other until the 19th century, marked by the coming of the pioneers. In Ogden, in Utah, they honor the memory of the pioneers. Their horses are also included in the celebration. Without them, the adventure would have been different. The Pioneer Days enliven the town every year, in the month of July. A colorful parade traces the epic of the first people to make it to this region. They came from afar, but they all originated in the same community, Lila McPhilothan. Okay, this, the 24th of July, is when the pioneers came to Utah. From, they came from England and then they went to Missouri and then they traveled to Utah. And so we celebrate the 24th of July for, for them coming into the valley on the 24th. And so the Mormons settled here in Utah. Everyone shows off their skills or their patriotism. All groups, all professions join in the fun. The spectators rediscover their roots, the values handed down to them from earliest childhood. Ogden isn't the only town to honor the pioneers. Andrew Jackson. Salt Lake has a big parade. Uh, other parades are held on different days than the, than the 24th. And uh, across the plains, and when they got to the Salt Lake area, they settled and uh, this is developed from that. It's an opportunity to initiate the younger generation. When I want to load this gun, I have to pour the powder right here, and then I tamp it down with this little lever. Then I have to put a cap on the other side like this. And when I fire it, the powder goes out, pushes the bullet out the barrel. The parade is also a reminder that the pioneers knew how to enjoy themselves. On the edge of town, at the end of the day, another event is getting underway. All the extras in the show take their places. The spectators for the traditional rodeo are ready. first performers drop out of the sky. There follows a moment of respect. Then the younger members come into the ring with some sheep that are not very cooperative. The aim is to stay on the beast. and the reward is a golden sheep. Then it's the grown-up's turn. They have to rehearse every movement. Then it's time to enter the arena. On a wild horse with no saddle, the rider has to stay on for at least eight seconds. With a saddle, it's 10 seconds. The 
rodeo is above all a spectacle, a show for all the family. And the riders are not all equally talented. The rodeo reenacts the activities carried out by the cowboys in their daily work. One of the organizers is Craig Billick. Rodeo is the traditional sport of man versus animal. This is one of the most exciting sports you can ever see. Uh, the cowboys are trying to show off their skills here in riding animals, handling animals, and getting animals to do basically the things they want them to do. And animals don't always want to do what they want to do. <laughs> In theory, the rodeo is a very virile sport, but that doesn't mean that the young ladies can't be excellent riders. What's bred in the bone comes out in the flesh. And when the mechanical horse breaks free, the excitement is just as great. The helmet replaces the hat, but the legend remains intact. Within the borders of Arizona and Utah, nature has produced some of its greatest achievements. Man has sometimes lent a hand, as in the case of Lake Powell, one of the largest artificial lakes in the world. Its shoreline runs for 3,500 kilometers, which is longer than the entire west coast of the USA. The lake is fed mainly by waters of the Colorado River. It took nearly 20 years to fill all the inlets of Glen Canyon, the longest canyon carved out by the river, which has now been dammed. Lake Powell has become an important base for this nautical playground. Originally, the lake was created to stabilize the unpredictable course of the Colorado and to produce electricity. In some places, the lake can be as deep as 170 meters. Lake Powell is so vast that it's impossible to discover all its little backwaters, even if you spend several days there. In the southwest of Utah, Zion National Park is a mecca for geologists. Several million years ago, the upper layers of the rock were at sea level. But when the tectonic plates shifted, they pushed the surface up to an altitude of 3,000 meters. Then erosion set about undermining it. The rock is stained red by iron oxide. In deference to nature's choice, the asphalt topping of the road is red. This landscape inspires artists. But it's not only the colors, it's also the atmosphere of the place that the painter appreciates. And with that comes inspiration. Rob Wilson. There's nothing more inspiring than this landscape. It's just phenomenal. I, I love the color, I love the sights, the sounds. I really love being out in nature and painting in plein air. Um, and there's, there's just nothing better than that, in my opinion. Nature can also produce some spectacular surprises. In the northwest of Arizona, on a vast level plateau, water erosion has produced a prodigious tour de force the Grand Canyon. Carved out by the Colorado River, the Grand Canyon goes down so deep it exposes rocks that are two billion years old. The vegetation growing down its sides is very varied. In fact, because of the difference in altitude between the top and the bottom of the canyon, most of the principal climatic zones on Earth are found there.
Beside the majesty of nature, man feels very small. There are many ways to visit the Grand Canyon National Park, but the most spectacular is by air. However, the pilots have to respect strictly defined routes. Brett Oliver. We cannot go down into the canyon uh, because uh, it is no longer safe, and it also uh, makes a lot of noise for the people that are down inside the canyon. Discovering the beauty of the canyon from the sky has become a veritable industry. Uh, approximately 100,000 people fly uh, over the Grand Canyon or into and out of the Grand Canyon each year. There are approximately 50 helicopters based here and another 20 airplanes. Moving on towards the west, once you've crossed the border between Arizona and Nevada and at the end of a long road across the desert, there appears a mirage, an apparition, Las Vegas. Las Vegas produces 70% of the income of the state of Nevada. The gambling town turns over a lot of money and attracts visitors from all around the world. It's a cosmopolitan town, but also an unlikely town that sprung from nowhere. Here, the historic monuments are imitation. The only genuine monuments are those raised to the glory of money, the casino hotels. Gambling was made legal in Las Vegas at the beginning of the 1930s to finance the education budget. Since then, takings have gone through the roof. Las Vegas is mirrored to infinity and shows itself off. Theaters are custom built to stage the most spectacular shows. Help, I need somebody. Just anybody Help! You know I need someone Help! You tell me that it's evolution Well, you know Built on the theme of Venice, one of the biggest hotels in the world has more than 7,000 rooms and about 20 restaurants. These casino hotels attempt to outdo each other in the ways they try to attract and keep their clientele. Here, the decor is inspired by the Baroque palaces of Venice, and beneath a sky that remains blue 24 hours a day, you're suddenly on St. Mark's Square, right in the heart of Venice. And on the canals, gondolas slip gently by. The gondoliers are genuine, as is the Sicilian accordionist. As for the Lion of Venice, he keeps an eye on commercial reality. Street entertainers appear on the square at very precise times. Outside, the illusion is maintained by piling up references to Venice a small version of the lagoon and, overlooking everything, the famous bell tower. Even the Rialto Bridge is there, with escalators instead of stairs. Right in front of the Doge's Palace, Venice in the middle of Nevada. Las Vegas is a town like no other. It's designed like a fun park with an incredible sense of excess. Las Vegas has become a myth, 
And for millions of visitors, it's important to immortalize the days when you rubbed shoulders with a legend. Many American legends have entered popular culture. Sometimes luck just passes you by. You can deposit personal effects in the pawn shop and borrow money on it. Any belongings not retrieved by their owners are often sold at very attractive prices. Most of the objects pawned could be described as bric-a-brac, but you can come across some little treasures. This is Portuguese design, Japanese made, one of the very first Japanese guns. Samurai gun, late 1600s, early 1700s. Apart from its gambling, Las Vegas is known the world over for another speciality, marriage. Why? Quite simply because the law of the state of Nevada allows you to marry and divorce without complicated formalities. What's more, here you can arrange your wedding as you like it. People come a long way to get married in Las Vegas. The people that they're brave to get married, they want to say, yes, I do. More likely that the one person that we got. Everywhere in the world. Everywhere. Name a country, we already have one of those here. In Las Vegas, you can get married any way you want. So why not in a helicopter? Yeah, we wanted to get married. Could have went scuba diving, could have done it in the sky. Well, on a helicopter, it's nice and safe, and you don't have to do much work, so come to Vegas. Yeah, it, get feels more, it feels more romantic in a helicopter. Here, everything is possible. You can even be married by Superman. You just have to give the minister the appropriate costume. I've always wanted to be Superman. Yeah, okay. There's three or four reasons they come to Las Vegas to get married. Uh, number one, it's uh, not expensive. Number two, there's no waiting period or blood test in the state of Nevada. And number three, a lot of them like to do a wedding like they want without worrying about family and friends and what they want. People kind of do what they want to do. And Las Vegas is a magic place. The Reverend James Harvest is ready. I leave tall buildings. <laughs> I jump over kitty cars. I'm Superman! It's Reverend Superman here at Hell USA, Las Vegas, Nevada. Only place in America that a couple get married with Superman. I'm the only Superman in the world that is licensed to do weddings. One small problem. The real Superman's logo isn't on his back. It's on his chest. There's no getting away from it. I don't care where I wear it. I just want it to no, be no, right. Listen. Where's this, my jockstrap? This, this, no, no, this is on the back. You have this on your back. This oh. is supposed to be on your front. Now. So you're showing too much skin on your back. <laughs> too sexy you, for us. I'm making you nervous. Okay, okay, turn it around. <laughs> no, yeah, you have to go the yeah, yeah. In Las Vegas, you have fun, but you do things properly, even if you're a beginner. First time Superman. Yeah! Even here, it's not every day you meet a Superman priest who doesn't take himself seriously. This is a joke, really. We're just kidding. That if a couple can stand still for five minutes, we'll marry them. Welcome to Vegas! The moment they've been waiting for is here at last. At these important times, the slightest detail is important. Superman can't find his seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> And off we go for the great adventure. Unlike in most American states, it's normal in Nevada to tolerate certain kinds of entertainment. Even the smallest gas station has one-armed bandits. It's a way of life that is jealously protected in this state. Going from Nevada into California, you pass through Death Valley, a fearsome desert. The geology of the valley is very unusual. 
It was the lifting up of the neighboring mountains that gave it its shape. The road goes down, and at Zabrisky Point, the land is rich with a variety of minerals which give the rocks their unreal colors. The rock is being constantly and severely eroded because of high temperatures and violent winds. The shapes are imperceptibly changing all the time. In Death Valley, the temperature in summer can reach incredible peaks. The place names are evocative. And the record temperature, 56 degrees centigrade in 1913. That didn't prevent Mormon pioneers crossing the valley in specially adapted contraptions. Suddenly, from out of the heat, a surprising edifice emerges. An opera house, founded in the middle of the desert by Martha Beckett, a New York dancer. Richard Regnell, the caretaker. Actually, there is. Uh, Marta really didn't care, to tell you the truth. She didn't care if anybody ever came to see any of her shows or not. Uh, she would like it, and eventually that did happen. Uh, she would put on, perform shows six days a week, whether somebody walked through the doors or not. The public comes from all over the world. Um, they come from Europe, Middle East, Asia, Europe, uh, of course, with a few of the Westerners, too. Ten million years ago, during the Ice Age, there was a huge 200-kilometer-long lake in the valley. As it evaporated, the lake water deposited a thick layer of minerals, which is still there in some places. The Devil's Golf Course is covered with salts and dried mud. At 86 meters below sea level, the bottom of Death Valley is not devoid of water. Sometimes heavy rainfall creates temporary rivers. Thanks to the variety of its rocks and the different effects of erosion, Death Valley presents a surprising diversity of landscapes. There are even dunes of pure sand that are transformed as the light changes. Still going west, the road climbs well above sea level to cross the Sierra Nevada, Spanish for snowy mountains. The highest summits are over 4,000 meters. In the middle of the 19th century, the mountain range witnessed the gold rush. With the discovery of gold nuggets in the American River, the destiny of the region was drastically changed. Thanks to a recent invention, the telegraph, the news spread quickly and prospecting began. The configuration of the gold ore deposits here is very special. The mother load of California runs roughly for about 150 miles uh, north and south through the state in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And it varies anywhere from about a half a mile to two or three miles wide. Uh, the mother load itself consists of what are called quartz veins, and these quartz veins are what have the gold in them. Um, the gold itself uh, is, is on top of the quartz veins and also goes way down inside the earth, and that is consequently why the miners dug these holes in the ground, was to extract that gold in the quartz veins. Once you've crossed the bridge of the Sacramento River, you enter the capital of California. Sacramento became the capital a few years after the first gold nuggets were discovered. The Capitol is the seat of state government. Modern architecture contrasts with the buildings of the old town.
Vestiges from the gold rush times, most of the buildings date back to the second half of the 19th century and are reminders of the prosperity of the town. Sacramento was a staging post between rural California and the great cities of the coast. California, the aeroplane is part of the way of life. In Cameron Air Park, the streets have aeroplane names and are wide enough for two planes to pass. Cameron Air Park is a village for pilots. Alan Thomas. Every house has a hangar either attached to the house or built separately from the house, but virtually every resident on this air park is, uh, is a pilot and an aircraft owner. In this small village, plane lovers like to meet up. They can devote themselves entirely to their passion and let their imagination take flight. Well, this is a uh, this is her mailbox, obviously, but it is a uh, uh, somewhat of a model of her T twenty eight, which is a uh, uh, former Navy trainer. Uh, from the 50s and 60s, and even into the 70s. It lasted a long time, so it's rather unique in that respect. It's the only one like it on the air park. Some of them work in San Francisco and do the return trip in the day. Far from being a luxury, here the plane is just an obvious way to get around. Napa Valley, 6 a.m. Another way of shaking off the shackles of gravity. You inflate the hot air balloon. But what can you see here from the sky? Jim Marshall. Uh, mostly wineries, uh, vineyards, um, the hills, the palisade cliffs that are back behind us here, and, and um, just the topography, it's, it's very scenic. Uh, it's geothermal area, so we have a lot of hot springs. The geyser, which we just flew over a second ago. Geothermal science is one of the resources of a region that is really privileged by nature. Besides wines and coming to drink wine, ballooning is probably the second most uh, popular thing to do in Napa Valley. And what better way to see the wineries from, from the air? High quality wine is produced in the Napa Valley. It's a recent production since it only began at the beginning of the 19th century. The United States occupies fourth place among the world's wine producers. California produces 90% of American wine. Wine estates often possess a remarkable real estate legacy. It shows how wealthy they are. Some buildings are reminiscent of antiquity, adapted by Hollywood. Others tend to be futuristic. Yet others are surrounded by cypress trees that remind you of Tuscany. Here, the style is rather classical. But what is more than classical is a castle built on the medieval Tuscan model. Imported from Europe, the stones were cut by hand to reproduce perfectly the original lines and volumes. The chateau produces a wide range of wines from different grape varieties. It produces mainly Sangiovese, literally the blood of Jupiter, a famous Tuscan wine. Aged in vaulted cellars, various appellations attract special attention. Jim Sullivan. This is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Other wines, too, are popular. Really great for growing Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Sangiovese, some of the uh, more hardy red varietals. Uh, down in the south of Napa, it's more like Burgundy and they grow a lot of the Pinot Noirs and the, uh, and the uh, uh, Chardonnay down in that valley. The conditions are ideal for growing vines. 
we got a lot of great soil here and a lot of great uh, climate and uh, conditions. Uh, for example, our vineyard here, we're on the Diamond Mountain District, we have very little topsoil. So the roots grow deep into the earth to get their uh, nutrients and bring those back up to the grapes. Valley Floor has a lot more topsoil and uh, hence the, uh, the tonnage per acre is greater down in the Napa Valley. As we go towards San Francisco, vines give way to forest. Here we find the tallest tree in the world, the sequoia. The sequoia is a conifer that can live for 2,000 years. It can also grow taller than 100 meters. The tree grows quickly and is very resistant to forest fires because of the thick, spongy bark. Most of the satellite towns around San Francisco join up to form a huge conglomeration called the Bay Area. This has a population of over 7 million and is one of the biggest economic zones in the USA. Built in 1930, the Bay Bridge is 7 kilometers long. It runs right into the heart of San Francisco, the mythical town of Northern California. Downtown San Francisco is the financial and business district. In the middle of the bay, the Alcatraz Penitentiary is also part of the legend. The prison has now been closed because of its mammoth running costs. Another mythical site is the Golden Gate Bridge. The bridge is painted orange so that it can be seen through the fog which frequently enshrouds the bay. It marks the separation between San Francisco Bay and the Pacific, while at the same time facilitating communication between the town and the north. On the north coast, a short distance from the Golden Gate Bridge, the houseboats of Sausalito ride at their moorings. Many hippies used to live in these floating houses in the 1960s and 70s. Sausalito was one of the bastions of the counterculture. Since then, rents have soared astronomically, and these days the area is more frequented by middle-class bohemians. San Francisco is built on about 40 hills, and because of this, as the traditional grid plan of American towns was adopted, the slope on some streets is quite unnerving. For example, Lombard Street, which has a gradient of up to 27%, eight bends in 400 meters, and a nickname, the windiest street in the world. They had to find a system of public transport able to cope with the slope. So they invented the cable car. A sort of tram car that has become an historic monument. The cable car is pulled by a cable that unrolls in the roadway. A traditional tram wouldn't be able to move, let alone brake on these slopes, with metal wheels on metal rails. The grip man operates a lever that grips the cable so that the vehicle can move forward. To stop, it's simple. You release the lever and you brake. At the end of the line, it's just as easy. There's a turntable. And in a few seconds, the cable car has turned around. 
It's ready to move off at a steady speed of 15 kilometers an hour. It's the only system of its kind in the world. The real estate heritage of San Francisco is remarkable. Thousands of Victorian houses have survived since the end of the 19th century, despite earthquakes, fires, and property developers. Built onto a wooden frame, the plans of Victorian houses were often identical, and the ornamentation was mass-produced. They're very much sought after. Because of their unusual colors, they're known as the painted ladies. Very open to the outside world, the town of San Francisco has always attracted immigrants from the world over and in large part from the Asian continent. The Chinese settled here in the middle of the 19th century. Their district, Chinatown, contains the largest Chinese community outside of Asia. The first Chinese, mainly Cantonese, came at the time of the gold rush. They were fleeing from the great economic and political difficulties of their own country. A second wave of Chinese arrived for the construction of the railroad at the end of the 19th century. To help each other and also for entertainment, they formed a very close-knit community. Haight and Ashbury streets gave their name to a very famous district with the reputation of being very liberal, very tolerant. During the 1960s and 70s, Haight Ashbury was the epicenter of the hippie movement and the counterculture. Since then, the residents have become more diversified and the Haight-Ashbury area seems to have almost returned to normal. However, behind the shops selling organic products, a special atmosphere prevails, a vestige of the past. A number of businesses quite openly foster the atmosphere and the relaxed nature of the area. Cultural references are the same as 50 years ago. No doubt times have changed, but slightly less so in Haight-Ashbury. Myths can be pretty tough. A cool, invigorating wind blows through San Francisco. Personalities can express themselves freely and without complex. Castro Street District has turned San Francisco into the gay capital of the United States. Here, people can freely demonstrate their preferences without worrying about what the neighbors might say. The first gays who settled in Castro at the end of the 60s came from the hippie generation. They chose to live in an area where the art of being different had been cultivated for years. Today, they're celebrating Halloween. The costumes give everyone the chance to accentuate their originality even more. Castro sets the unusual tone of a progressive town open to the world. San Francisco is the outcome of a long search at the frontier of the American West, a town where dreams come true and where myths live on. On Halloween night, the celebration blows away everyday life. Whether you're male or female, who cares? We'll sort it out tomorrow.
South of San Francisco, the last frontier is marked out by towns with legendary names that shine like promises. Towns with just one horizon, the Pacific. San Francisco is not far away, and yet the Pacific Ocean shore has remained surprisingly wild for a large part of the coastline. It harmoniously alternates rocky areas that are difficult to get to and sandy places that are jealously protected. An area where nature is conserved and stretches as a long panorama on the Pacific. In the old days, sardine fishermen and whale hunters used to berth in the port of Monterey. Fishermen would tie up to the jetty at Fisherman's Wharf. Monterey was the name of the Viceroy of Mexico when the region was discovered by a Spanish sailor. The Spanish named the town in his honor. Monterey became the capital of California at the end of the 18th century and remained so for 73 years. One very spectacular road is 17 Mile Drive. It passes through the most beautiful landscapes of the Monterey Peninsula. This tall road is lined with huge houses and luxurious properties that share among themselves the best sites around three golf courses. These courses enjoy an international reputation and perfectly manicured greens. Here, man takes care of nature, and only the Pacific spray is allowed into these very private areas. Man lives at one with the wild nature that surrounds him. He keeps a particularly close watch on the tranquility of the sea lions that congregate on the rocky islets. Visitors are welcome. In a highly protected environment, nature seems to give its creativity free reign. The trees are twisted by the wind and scoured by the sea salt until they are just ghostly silhouettes. It was on the beach at Carmel that the first Spanish explorers landed. Carmel by the sea, to give it its real name, was founded at the beginning of the 1900s. This initiative was down to the artists who appreciated the beauty of the place. Indeed, art always has a special place in a setting where Spanish influences manifest. Spanish Franciscans founded a mission here at the end of the 18th century. They employed Indians who worked the adobe, which is mud dried in the sun. Further south, the fields remind us that California is the leading state for farming in the United States. Arable land covers a quarter of the state. More than half the fruit and vegetables produced in the United States comes from California. Some of the farms practice the pick-your-own system. You pick the fruit yourself.
On the coast, there's a quiet little place that owes everything to the ocean, even its name, Oceano. Oceano is well known because vehicles of every kind are allowed on the beach. There are thrills aplenty on a strip of sand where the traffic can be hair-raising. At Oceano, the beach is the place for mechanical amusements. But you can also set up camp here for a day or a week. It's an original way of staying in touch with nature. In fact, nature gets so close that you sometimes have to put up some defenses. Oh, we're building a moat. High tide tonight. Came up to there last night. Sometimes, too, your stay has to be extended. We don't know what we're going to do yet. <laughs> we're going to try something. We're going to get out. Some dunes are also accessible to the more adventurous. The image of California is often associated with surfing, a really mythical sport. Surfing was introduced to the Californian beaches from Hawaii at the end of the 19th century. The sport belongs to the popular culture in California. The mobility of the camping car means that surfers can get to their favorite spots. It's a way of ensuring close contact with nature. Santa Barbara and its beaches are iconic in California and known to all as the American Riviera. Many things have changed since the 1960s. But a few picturesque characters perpetuate the good old days. Straight out of the hippie movement, flower power, one survivor shares his experience and his vehicle. Come take a look, kids. Take a picture over here with me. You want to take a picture with the hippie? Stand on the magic carpet. See the magic carpet, sweetheart? And let's do a peace sign. Now do the peace sign to mom. Ready? Peace. This professional hippie, as he calls himself, has always been a groundbreaker. If you look on the door, long before there was Facebook, I had over 300 of my friends paint themselves in my circle of love. <laughs> this is the original social network, hippie inner Facebook, huh? Invention, hallucination. The hookah on the side of the art car, can you see it? It's fully functioning from Alice in Wonderland. So you can smoke marijuana right off of the art. That's what makes it the ultimate hippie van. Isn't that great? A real film set. Lights, camera, action! All right. All the world's a stage. We are all with the players upon the stage of life. Don't panic, go organic. Here, all passions can express themselves. The 1960s are still very popular and even have some new converts. Eternal values that all generations share. At one with nature and in tempo with its history, the American West has remained faithful to its landmarks. The ocean stands as the last frontier marking the fulfillment of legendary America.